Good morning, y'all good? good. All right, good. We're going to rock out for a minute. Hey, um, as, as uh, Ms. Baggy just said, she used some big words. It's a lot of pressure, man. She used All right, well, I'm Michael White. Some people know me as Michael Bam Bam White. Uh, so we're just going to chop it up this morning. What I'm going to do, I think the best way to kind of go about doing this is kind of share my life. And as I share my life, maybe you'll grab something from my story that'll help you understand how you could also just grow in life. So I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, born and raised, when I was born, uh, my mom, she was 18, and my mom was addicted to drugs when she had it. So I had a lot of complications as it pertains to psychology and mental and things of that nature. My pops, my pops was cool. I knew who my pops was when my pops was around. My, my dad was military, so he was overseas all of my childhood. And I was gonna go into the foster care system, but my grandmother adopted me at the age of one, so I wouldn't go into the foster care system. So I was born in the streets, raised in the hood, just like some of y'all might be. So my story began the same way a lot of, maybe some of your stories and some of your friends' stories began. But how did things happen for me? Well, I had some people in my life that really believed and saw more in me than I saw in myself. Because the streets I was from made me think that the only thing I could become was a product of the streets. Because most of my friends and most of the people I saw were products of the streets. So what made me think I could do something better than what I saw my friends doing? But again, it was other people that saw something in me I didn't see in myself. And the crazy thing is, the dude that saw, I ain't gonna say he saw the most in me, but the dude that really like pushed me away from the streets, I went one morning, I shared this last time I was here. I went one morning uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from, and where I'm from in Birmingham, in 1996, when I moved to Richmond, my zip code was the deadliest zip code in the nation. You can look it up. We had 84 people get popped and died in 1996, just in my zip code. That's not the whole city. That's just where I was from. So danger was always around me. So of course, when you live in the streets like that, what you gotta get? You gotta get, you know, some people to hang around. You gotta get a clip. You gotta have some level of psychological protection. So what did I try to do? I wouldn't go join the Bloods. So I never forget, I pull up in, when I pull up in, the leader smacks me and tells me to get the hell out of there. And I'm like, yo, what is this about? The dude that was in the streets, that ran the streets, saw something in me I didn't see in myself. And told me I wasn't, it wasn't that I wasn't built for that life, but I had something else that was greater than he even saw in me. So I, I leave, and I'm trying to figure out, like, well, what does he see that I don't see? So life goes, I ended up getting with a mentor, this dude by the name of Otis Wayne Bisbee. And uh, this was the guy that I didn't know at the time was the one that's gonna really pour into me and make me believe in myself more than I believe in myself. Now some of y'all right now got people that's standing on these walls that's been telling you stuff, or people that's sitting in these classrooms that's been telling you stuff that you like, ah, it don't make sense. It might not make sense right now, but a lot of you later on in life are gonna turn around and thank the people that are telling you stuff over and over again, even when it seems like you're not listening. Everybody in here wants to be great. Everybody in here wants to be great. The problem is sometimes you don't believe you can be great, again, because of the people around you. How many people by show of hands already know what you want to do when you grow, when you get older? How many people? What do you want to do? Be a mechanic. Awesome. What do you want to do? Entrepreneur. What kind of entrepreneur? That's all. That's awesome. You know yet? Oh, you want to turn up? Okay. <laughs> That's what's up. Who else said they knew what they wanted to be? What you want to be? Child psychologist. Child psychologist. Ooh. What makes you want to do that? Love it. Love it. Love it. So you want to speak to you. When you become an adult, you want to speak to the kid that you see that's just like you and learn how to help them get through what you're going through. That's called it. That's empathy. That's empathy. When you care so much about other people that you want to make sure that they're okay. And sometimes, I'm not here to speak religion. I'm just here to speak the way that I understand how to speak. Sometimes God will carry you through stuff so that you'll know how to actually help the next person that's going through what you've gone through. Mm. Sometimes you have to go through something so that you can be a vessel to help the next person. That's what you just said you wanted to do. The number one thing to become what you want to become is hang around people that can help you be that. Hang around people that can 
and help you get to where you're trying to go. One of the greatest things that you can do to hang around people is you might not even want to hang around a child psychologist, but you want to hang around people that make you feel good. How many people here got haters? People hate on you for no reason. Now, yeah, I like that. Two hands up. If you don't have any haters, it's because you ain't doing nothing. If you don't have any haters, it's because you ain't doing nothing. Haters don't hate on people that ain't doing nothing. Haters only hate on people that got something going on in their life. Haters hate on people that see something greater than themselves that the hater don't want to see them accomplish. If you don't have any haters, find you some haters. Find a way to get some haters. I got about six or seven. I'm trying to get about five or six more. <laughs> because think about it. Is it worth hating on somebody that ain't doing nothing? No. There's nothing to hate. Yes. Does the family members hate haters? Say it again. Does family members hate haters? Does family members can hate on you. Absolutely. There's a saying, to your point, there's a saying. Your family and friends won't support you until strangers start to celebrate. Your family and friends, a lot of them won't support you until strangers start to celebrate you. Because every, when strangers start to celebrate you, the first thing they want to do is jump up. That's my cousin. That's my cousin. my kid for right there. Because, because of what you're doing, making them think that they can look good through the stuff that you're doing. So yeah, family can be haters. They can be. But at the same time, people that hate on you, they also watch you. And as you grow, you are also, this is going to sound crazy, you are inspiring them to even be better. Because the reason they hate on you because a piece of them, they're looking at you believing what they can and cannot do. But the more that you do it, sometimes it makes them say, you know what, maybe I can do that too. When I go back home to Birmingham, I got homeboys and friends that I used to hang out with. And sometimes they'll, you know, try to get me a little cold show for years when we were younger in our 20s and 30s. And they'd be like, yo, bam, man, you know when it did all this, you traveling the world doing comedy. Man, you know, sold out. You know what I'm saying? You left us. Dog, I didn't leave you, bro. You just couldn't keep up. And I'd be doggone if I'm going to stand here and wait on you to get ready. I got somewhere I'm trying to go. I got stuff I'm trying to do. Do not let other people bring you down and stop you from going the way that you want to go. If you got people, if you are the smartest person in your circle, you need to find a new circle. If you are the smartest person in your circle, you need to find some other people to hang out with. Yes? Because you can't help people that don't want to be helped. If you hang around people that don't want to go anywhere, why are you going to stand there and try to help them? The best way you can help them is to lead them and let them see greatness in you. Then they might change their mind. You can't change their mind. You can influence them to change their mind, but you can't change them. And that influence comes from what you might do and what they see you do. But then, what if you try to stand back and help them? You just standing there trying to help them, and you just running in a circle with them. What is that doing for you? Nothing. So that's why you got to keep pushing. And pray for them. Think about them. Wish them well. Literally want them to become greater. Don't do it to show out on them. Don't do it to say, look what I'm doing. Don't become boastful. Because the moment you become boastful, there is a thing called life that will humble you. It will put you right back where you started. So as you become blessed, understand that you are given things to give to others. The reason I do comedy in the beginning, because I wanted to make paper, I want to become a superstar. I had my mind and my goals on all these big dreams, the big house, the big car. It was all about me, 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 me. And God shifted me. I lived in L.A. When I lived in L.A., I had a comedy college in Hawaii. So think about my starting. Think about my mom. Think about how I was raised. Think about being adopted. Now I'm this dude living in L.A. with a comedy college in Hawaii. Running a comedy college. I'm going to Hawaii every other month. I'm from the streets. Hawaii was something I saw in a magazine. It wasn't something I ever really thought I could go to. Now I'm working it. I get back home from Hawaii. My roommate knocks on my door like, yo, man, it's water. And, and water coming out the plugs and the light fixtures. Dude up above me in our condo had broken a pipe. My whole condo got flooded out. So now I'm displaced. I have nowhere to stay. I'm pretty much homeless at this point. 
I'm living in LA, stored up. I'm trying to keep booking shows so that I can go stay in hotels while I'm on the road because I don't have anywhere to live. I shifted. I ended up coming back to Richmond. I'm moving to New York. I was supposed to be in Richmond for three days. I was moving from LA to New York. I'm supposed to be here for three days. I've been here for 10 years. But this is what I believe. I believe God was like, yo, so you went out there and got a little taste of what you wanted. Now let me reposition you so I can set you up for what I want. And what he did is set me here and allowed me to now do what I'm doing. And here's the crazy thing. Oh, here's the crazy thing. When I was in LA, I was making good money. And I was becoming well more known than what I was at the time. Now I'm in Richmond, I'm becoming less known, but now I'm making more money. But the crazy thing is I'm making more of an impact. I found out that the gift God gave me isn't about becoming rich and famous, it's about using it to serve. My gift has created this moment. This moment to stand in front of you all and talk to you all about what my life has been about. This came from me doing comedy. So if you got something you love, start working on that passion. But also be sure to use that passion as a gift to give to others. Because if you do that, you'll keep getting. You'll keep getting. I believe the reason that uh, Oprah Winfrey got the money she got because of how much she gave. I believe Michael Jackson, because some of y'all might not really know Mike like, you know, we know Mike. But I believe the reason Michael Jackson was such a celebrity and was such an impact he was because he also for a while broke the world record for the most philanthropic giving. If you give, you have nothing to do but open yourself up to continue to receive. If you genuinely give. So build up whatever you want. To the, so now, I shifted my focus on comedy from not trying to be the richest and the most famous, but to try to help mental health. So when I stand on stage, my purpose now is to help mental health. That is my whole purpose. If you want to be an entrepreneur, and if anybody wants to be an entrepreneur, the first question when you become an entrepreneur is not how much money I can make or what do I need to sell. The first question is what problem am I about to solve? If you continue to solve a problem, you will always be in business. The moment you just start counting checks and dollars and, and start, you know, profit and loss, then that's when you're going to have trouble. You can keep solving the problem. Now, every day ain't, ain't good. I tell people all the time when I talk about who, who are around you, be around people that make you feel good. And be around people that's not around you for what you got or for who you are. Because the people that's around you for what you got, the moment you don't have that no more, are they going to be around you? No. Nah, they are. But for the people that are around you because of who you are, they're going to be there when times are good, and they're going to be there when times are bad. They're going to go through the ups with you and the downs. But be around people that make you feel good. How you feel, I want y'all to catch this. How you feel creates what you think. What you think creates what you do. What you do creates your habits. Your habits creates your character, and your character creates your destiny. But it starts with how you feel. You have power over your feelings all the time. The greatest power that you have is the power of resistance. Sometimes, how many people here, if you would have been Chris Rock, you would have just stood there and let Will Smith smack you? Anybody? You would have stood there and let it happen? How many people, if, Chris, if Will Smith would have smacked you, you would have, you would have fired back, right there? Yep. And that's real. Yep. And that's real. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing about it. I want y'all to watch what happened with Chris. Have you noticed what has happened with Chris since that incident? Yes. What's happened? Huh? Have you seen have you seen his ticket sales? Yeah, his ticket sales went from average like fifty something dollars to like a little bit over five hundred dollars. Now if he would have smacked Will Smith back, they both would have been a decline. Your greatest power is the power of resistance. It's the power to not do something that you don't want to deal with tomorrow. I don't want to do nothing today. I don't want to deal with tomorrow. And if I let my temper get me in trouble today, I got to deal with that tomorrow. If I go do something today, I smack somebody, I hurt somebody, I say something bad to somebody, then when I wake up tomorrow, I still got to deal with that. I don't want to do nothing today I don't want to deal with tomorrow. 
And I'm not going to allow you to make me do something today I don't want to deal with tomorrow. I treat everybody the same. I deal with them differently. How I treat you is up to me. How I deal with you, that's up to you. But I am held accountable for how I treat you. I'm not held accountable for how you treat me. And I refuse to let the devil in you bring out the devil in me. I can't do it. Now people say, well, bam, uh, what if, what if uh, you know somebody rob people, you gonna still treat them right? Yes, I will give you water on the porch, but you can't come in my house. <laughs> but I'm going to still treat you right. Treat people, I know it's like it sounds so cliche and it sounds so uh, treat people the way that they want to be treated, the way you want to be treated. But that's a real thing, y'all. Oh. That's a real thing. And everybody ain't going to treat you right. The people you do good for ain't going to do good for you all the time. Never give anything that you need back. My grandmother used to always tell me that. Never give anybody anything that you need back. Because if you give it to them and they don't give it back to you, you're stuck. But if you can give people things that you don't really need, you might want it back, but you don't really need, if they don't give it back to you, you're still good. I had a homeboy, James Ferry, who played years in the NFL. Um, we sitting at his house one day in Pittsburgh, he played for the Steelers. And we sitting at his house, Dude asked for like eleven hundred dollars. So Jay's mom was sitting there. Dude, he gave the dude eleven hundred dollars. Jay's mom was like, "Well, you know he ain't gonna pay that back." He said, "Yeah, I know, but I also gave him eleven hundred dollars to get rid of it." <laughs> because the simple fact he ain't gonna pay it back, which means he's also not gonna come around because he ain't gonna have my money. So he paid him to go away. But Jay didn't leave the eleven hundred dollars. But dude, he got dude out of his life. Don't give nobody nothing that you can't afford to give away. Image. I know, um, and I'm, I'm going to do a quick Q and A, so I'm not going to talk y'all to death. But there's nothing live a life where man, it's nothing more fulfilling than giving. Live a life where there's nothing more fulfilling than giving. I gave somebody something. They were like, "Yo, what, what you need back?" I'm like, "Nah, I don't, I don't really need nothing back, though, because there's nothing that you can give me that's going to make me feel better than what I gave you." Live a life where there's nothing in your life better than giving. Now, you might not have money to give. Sometimes giving is just a simple smile. Sometimes giving is just a simple pound. Sometimes giving is just a simple how you doing. Giving don't have to be something big. Giving comes subtly. If everybody smiled at everybody in the school one day, it'll be a happy school just from the expression that everybody gives each other. Simple giving. Give, give, give. And the last thing is be yourself. A lot of y'all on Instagram, TikTok, and y'all see what all these other people out here doing. You see what it looked like they got. The thing about Instagram and TikTok is people are only mostly of the time showing you the best part of their life. You ain't seeing the struggle. So don't think because every time you see so-and-so on TikTok dripped out, got their swag on, look like they always turned up, believe you me, when that TikTok and that Instagram is off, they going through it just like everybody else in life. So you might as well be yourself. Why become a worthless copy to copy when you were set up to be a unique power source? Don't become a worthless copy of somebody else. Be yourself. Be yourself. And again, and, and hang with people that will let you be yourself. If you ain't got it today, you ain't got it. Don't be afraid to say I ain't got it. If times are hard, find people that you can share that with. Now don't tell everybody your business, because y'all know you tell people your business. And they run around telling everybody else your business. Five people you can trust. The first people I say that five you can trust are these people standing on the wall and the teachers that you got and the counselors you got. Because they understand what you're going through. But go be the greatest part of yourself. Now, as it pertains to being a comic or whatever, I want to take a couple of questions because I think that's more important than just me sitting up there talking to you. If I got a question about anything, teachers too, y'all can chime in as well. If not, I'm going to start. What you got, brother? Uh, who? Do dogs count? A man's best friend? Absolutely a dog count. Yes. What you got? What's my best accomplishment? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can we start with the lower level questions? <laughs> um, I think my greatest... I, what popped in my head is 
forgiving my mother for abandoning me. I think that's one of my greatest accomplishments. My mom abandoned me, and um, I held that in my heart for a long time. And then when my mom died, my mom, she died from an overdose. So then I realized she wasn't here to say I'm sorry. She wasn't here to hear my voice or to hear my, my pain. So now I had to figure out how to get through that myself. And then I realized drug addiction is a disease. My mom probably wanted to love me the way that I wanted her to love me. But she was locked into this, this system, this, this thing. And I had to forgive her for that. Um, and when I forgave her, like literally forgave her and had empathy for what she went through, it freed me up to do so much more. So I would say that's one of my greatest accomplishments. Great question. Yes. So what happened was, it's a great question. Um, I had written a business plan to open up my own theater. So I got here and found that there was a theater that was just like the one that I wanted to open up. So I started trying to buy the theater. When I started trying to buy the theater, of course, it went meeting after meeting. But then I started getting involved in community work. And that's what I mean by the shift. I ended up not getting the theater, but after a year of meetings, I was so involved in this community stuff, I couldn't just up and leave. And that's why I think when I was talking about the shift that God did for me, he used bait, oh, theater, I got something for him. He dangled it, little, just a little care. Now, I don't even, I'm not even really paying attention I'm doing this work. And then when I'm like, oh, I can't get the theater, that one because of the money, because of the paperwork and other stuff, I'm like, dang, but then I was already locked in with all this other community stuff. So community is what got me here. Yeah. All right, as you stated at the beginning, right, you said only surround yourself around people that that like that you want to. I don't know how to fit it. At, like, I so, got you though. Yeah. But yeah, but say you, you surround yourself around people that that you're doing better as. Shouldn't you want to? Shouldn't that motivate? Shouldn't you want to motivate your friends to do better and stuff? Oh, absolutely. Now I don't listen. If you hang around people, everybody want to be better. Rock with those people when they really want to be better. Now, they're going to make mistakes because you're going to make mistakes. And they need to hold you accountable for your mistakes. Don't hang around people that let you make mistakes and act like it's all good. Hang around people that when you make those mistakes, they want to boost you up. But absolutely, find you a dope circle that when you grow, they grow. When they grow, you grow. But make sure you hang around people that represent you well even when you're not around. I can tell what kind of person you are by the friends you got. You can be hanging... It could be like, say, for instance, you could be by yourself, you over there, and I can see a group of friends, I see the way they acting, they're very respectful, they're saying yes sir, no sir, no sir, they laugh and they joke, they're full of joy, and when I see you walk in and you walk to that group, before I even know anything about you, I know what type of person you are because of that group right there that you're friends with. Does that make sense? But it's the same thing. If I see a bunch of friends hanging out and they cussing and yelling, disrespecting women, if you're a dude, disrespecting adults, and then when you walk out that room and walk over to that group, if I don't know nothing about you, I know what type of person you are. So hang around people that represent you well, even when you're not around. You gotta hang around them. Any more questions? I got you, and I got you. Yeah, what you got? So, oh, good question. Um, so I wanted, my, my goal was to do some community stuff, but I wanted to do the things that I want to do. I, want, I do want to make paper. I want to make it seem like, oh, no, I don't want no money anymore. Just spent 12 no, I'm trying to kick up, just like everybody else. I want to be a millionaire. So the first friends I started to hang around was millionaires, but respectful millionaires. I was in um, a good buddy of mine, Jesse knows him. Um, I was hanging around a bunch of comics, and I had good friends. But I wanted to elevate myself. So I had to find better company. Not better as in people, but better that represented what I wanted to become. The first guy I befriended was a brother by the name of Kim Greenwich. Kim Greenwich is the vice president of NBC 12. We were on a trip in San Diego, and I said, yo, when we get back to Richmond, I want to meet with you. And he was like, cool. So we met at Can Can one morning um, on Cara Street. He was like, what do you want to, what do you want to meet about? He thought I wanted to meet about business. And I'm like, no, I just want to chop it up with you. We were supposed to have a 30 minute meeting. We ended up having a two hour, not meeting, a two hour get to know one another. Now the thing is, when I started hanging with people like Kim and the other power sources in the city, I understood in the beginning, I had to keep my mouth shut. I had nothing to offer this group. They were the top story, and they still are. So I had to be quiet. I couldn't, like when I'm hanging around my other friends, I can be like, 
yeah, I can tell people stuff, but because I'm leveling up, now I gotta be quiet and listen. Let them know I belong with them because I don't have what they have yet. yet. But what I do have is the same heart they got because I believe God leads up to the people that our heart matches up. Because there's other power sources I could have become friends with, but he was the one that I, I was led to. Um, so I leveled up by just hanging around people that I would, that have gone where I want to go. Not the people that talk about it, not the people that boast about it, not the people that got the same ideas that I got, but the people that have actually done it. So that's when I started to level up. But again, it was, it was a lonely space. Because when you shift it from one group of friends to another group of associates, it's, it's a time where you got to be by yourself. You got to be okay being by yourself. And then there's a time, like again, when you get in there, because if I just get in there and just start running my mouth about stuff, I don't know what I'm talking about. They gonna look at me and be like, nah, we good, bro. You know what I mean? So get in those groups, level up, and just be quiet and listen, become a student. Uh, and become two things. Always keep this in mind. Always have a high willingness to learn and a high willingness to accept change. If you always have a high willingness to learn, that means you will never ever accept any little thing. You are always up investigating. You're always trying to find more out about it. But then when you find out you might be wrong, then you gotta have a high willingness to accept change. Now it's time to change. If I tell you two plus two equal five your whole life, and then somebody come along later and be like, yo dog, two plus two equals four. And then I can prove it to you, but you don't want to go with it, then you might have a high willingness to learn, but you don't have a high willingness to accept change. You got to change as you learn. Don't learn something new that's better for you, but then stay the same way that you are, that you know ain't working for you. Yes, ma'am. Well, you sort of answered my question, because my question was, if I have, if I have a group of friends that <clears throat> isn't making me the best person I can be, how do I keep that group from and, and because school is tough. Yes. First thing you got to do is get legitimately busy. Get busy doing things that you want to do. Because I could hang in the streets. Once my grandmother put me in sports, once my grandmother made me go to all these camps, because my grandmother in the summertime, I used to just be in the streets. Then all of a sudden she started getting me occupied. So it wasn't that I didn't want to hang with my friends, I didn't have the time to. And because I was into something else that kept me busy, I ended up meeting new friends in this new busy world. Does that make sense to you? Because my time was occupied. Because it is hard for me to just say, I don't want to hang with y'all no more and just stand over here by myself. But if I'm busy, I don't have to say I don't want to hang with y'all no more. I can't. I'm busy. So get busy doing something that is in the direction of where you really want to go. That's one step that'll help you Get new friends. And then if you got one of your boys or homegirls that in one circle might not be good for you, but because they see you doing something and they come to where you are, a lot of times they're coming to where you are to also become better. That's the influencing part that I was talking about earlier. So just keep moving in the direction that you want to go. The right people are coming. If it's 10 people in your crew and you go to another level and only two of them come with you, those are the two that's supposed to be with you. Let the other eight watch all three of y'all. But get busy. Get busy. Next question. Get back. What you got, brother? That's now. Oh man, that's now. What's my most important goal? Uh, so I'm trying to get to a numbers game. I want to open myself up to be able to do more philanthropic work. But of course, you got to make money at the same time. So I got a system where I'm doing in my head where I'm trying to make a certain amount of money in a short, short period of time so that I can leave myself a long time. Um, to work. So I do stand up, as you know, um, and to give you in latest term, by the time I'm 50, I'm 46 now. By the time I'm 50, I want to make, I want to do 50 shows a year for $20,000 per show. That'll be a million dollars for less than two months of work, which will leave 10 months to open up for me to do other things for the community. So that's my goal is trying to get, get the money right so I can just go and get it. Yeah. Still about giving it. Yeah. Go ahead, somebody else had a question. Yeah, what's going on? What kind of stuff you have? What kind of student were you? Oh, I was a horrible student. <laughs> oh, I was, oh, Jesus Christ, I was a horrible student. Uh, I wasn't a bad student. Like, I didn't stay in the office, I didn't stay in trouble, but I had a learning disability because of my mom's drug addiction that didn't allow me to process the way that other students were processing. So I was a 123 IQ, which is a very above average IQ, but I was a DFC student. 
because I couldn't process the way the system was set up. So what's crazy is I wasn't able to process and school can be set up where, and this is no knock on anybody in here, just the system itself can be set up to where if you don't pass in this system, it, it, it seems like when you're definitely going to be a failure. If y'all are DF students, is it cool? No, it's not cool. But if you have a dream, you still will have something that you'll go out. Because the thing about school is, it wasn't about whether I made A's, B's, and C's. It was about the simple fact that I learned how to learn. So then when I got to something that I wanted to learn, school had given me the foundation to be able to learn it. But no, I was a horrible student. I was the worst. But, you know, my, here's the crazy thing. My sister ended up being the principal of the elementary school that was on the same property as my high school. So when my sister knew that I was failing, she knew I probably wouldn't want to graduate on time, which thank God I did. So my sister started to pull me aside out of school. Like, I'd never get them hanging on what we would call back then the stoop. Some of the, uh, in my old head, they know what the stoop is. We hanging on the stoop, my sister pulled around the corner in that little red shadow, Mike get in this car. And I'm all embarrassed, and I get in the car, and so my sister started tutoring me at the end of the night, and she would do it in a very fun way. Like, if I wanted dinner or if I wanted like snacks or something, she would find a fun way to teach me. And I never forget, I, I had an American history test. And I went and took that test, I, I studied hard for that test, and I was spelled in American history. And I made a 96 on the test. I was, my grades were so bad that when I made a 96, the teacher swore I cheated. She made me stay after school and take a different test, same chapter, but a different test, I made 100. So it wasn't that I couldn't learn. I just, the system couldn't be shoved down my throat. It's just not the way I was able to learn. So yeah, I was a bad student, but again, it had to do with the people that were around me. That, did, cause I didn't want to go with my sister. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to hang with my friend. She made me go. I'm so grateful that she made me go. Somebody got, what happened? Sit again, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, me and Ms. Back, we went to our uh, seminary together. That's right. <laughs> Similar? No, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, how would you say how um so or how it impacts So y'all know what seminary is, right? Seminary seminary is where preachers go to learn more about how to preach. If you learn about the Bible, um, it's just like some people call it God school. The greatest thing that I learned, I want to be careful when I say this. Um, I learned about truth. And one thing I learned about, one of the main things I learned about truth was that truth is in religion because it's true. Truth is not true because it's in religion. If you take religion and remove it from truth, truth stands alone. But if you take truth out of religion, religion will fail. So that was one of the greatest things that I learned about truth. Um, because there are some things that we learned that we ain't going to get into today, but it was out. It was big time out. Um, but that was the greatest thing. And, and it impacted me because I always knew I had this little, little calling in my life. Um, and I knew comedy was one of the things that was my calling. But really, I believe comedy is setting me up to communicate to a whole different audience. Yeah, so that's what I learned. Yeah. Are you like a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Am I a who? Are you like a Christian? Because I heard your name and when Ms. Jackson said it, I was like, so do you, is that, you're a comedian that's like, there's one who does Christian? Oh, yeah, she's getting back to church, Dad. Yeah, that's my guy. Yeah, 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 that's me. Uh huh. I do. I know most of them. J.C., it's my man. You J.C.'s daughter. J.C., you your uncle. I mean, that's your uncle. Yeah. Word. Did you, did you have a kid? Somebody. Tony just, just had a kid. Yeah, J.C., my dude. Oh my that's what's up, man. J.C., I'm at his daughter. Yo, her dad is mad funny. Like, they skate, they skate ignorant, you know. 
He's ignorant. I'll take one or two more questions. All right. So in closing, what you got, sister? Yes. So, um, so when you, so when people probably counted you out of high school because of your low grade, how did you get into college and what motivated you to do that? So that a lot of students know that sometimes what they do here, they can still have the opportunity to go even though they make some bad decisions. Man, number one, again, I go back to there were people that believed in me that, um, so I, I had a community around me, so that was one thing. But then the other thing, again, like I said in the very beginning, Everybody in here want to be great. Some of y'all scared to be great. You're afraid of what great look like because you're familiar being where you are right now. But just because I believe, I believe, and I still believe that I can be great. And even though in my beginnings and my starting and all that, I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I believed it. And I think with my power of belief, things that I didn't think would happen started to happen which college ended up being one of them. Um, also, when I wanted to level up, the friends that I wanted to be like, they all went to college. So I'm like, yo, I want to rock and do it the way they do it. Like, I got to fall suit. So I had to start off at a community college. I had to start off at a college that would just accept me. Um, because I, again, I didn't have the grades. I barely graduated. So I went to community college. And when I got to community college, that's when I really started to commit because I thought I was somebody at that point, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the friends I want, they went to college and I'm now in college, so look at me, I'm important. And luckily when you go to a community college, quite often there are people that understand your struggles as to why you went there. And they'll take a little extra time to get you to where you need to be. So don't be afraid to go to community college, the community college route. Um, but that was the way that I had to get in. And then once I did that, I had a band scholarship to Alabama a and I played the tuba. Um, and then the rest of life was history. But I knew I wanted to be a comedian. I started doing comedy at the age of 20. Um, if you already know you want to be something, start doing it now. There's a statement that it takes 10,000 hours to become a professional at anything. 10,000 active hours. Fortunately, so if you worked uh, 40 hours a week, 8 hours a day, 5 days a week, it would take you almost 6 years to get to 10,000 hours. So if you want to do hip hop, you got to get in the studio. You got to study artists. You got to write. You got to get it in. If you want to be a musician, if you want to produce, you got to. You got to work. You got to get it. And the person that works the hardest always wins. <clears throat> it's not the person that's the most talented. The person that works the hardest always wins. Kevin Hart is my homeboy. He is not the funniest person on earth to me. <laughs> He's just not. I don't talk to him that to his face. Like, oh, you ain't the funniest. He's good. But he ain't the funniest. I know many people that are funny. But one thing Kevin does better than everybody, he outworks everybody. While we turn in the club, one, two o'clock in the morning, doing three more, four more rounds of shots, Kevin like, yo, I got to get out of here, bro. I got to work out at 6 o'clock in the morning. What? 6 o'clock in the morning. But he gets up and he does it. He outworks everybody. If you want to be great at sports, you got to practice while the other team practicing. You gotta practice harder while the other team's practicing, but when practice is over, what you gotta go do? Practice some more. In order for me to get past you, I gotta work when you work, and I gotta work when you not work. That's how I'm gonna get past you. It ain't talent, y'all, it's hard work. Whoever works the hardest wins. And sometimes people that are really talented, that's a curse, because when they're really talented, they think they don't have to do that much work. I don't care what anybody thinks about LeBron James or Michael Jordan or who's the greatest or any of that. But what I will say, those people are naturally talented. But the reason they're considered some of the GOATs is because they put in the work too. Don't just let talent think that you think that that's gonna, what's going to get you there. It ain't just talent. It's work. So yeah, I went to college, but I had to do it the right way. I had to, the way I could do it, which was go to, um, go to a um, two-year college and go that route. So don't be ashamed if you got to do it a different way. It don't matter, as long as you do it. Because if you don't do it, what you gonna get out of that? Nothing. So you might as well go ahead and do it. What you got, brother? Uh, how long did it 
take you to Peter Scott? That's a good question. Let me count. Uh, it was about a seven year process. About a seven, eight year process. But, he, but here's what I want you to get from that. Yeah, you want to go and you want it to be four years, but if it take eight, 12, 15, however long it take you, just don't stop until you get it. Everybody's timeline is different. Just don't stop until you get it. I saw one more hand back there. What you got, brother? All right, so I got it. Um, let's, can you give me some advice for like somebody that's ready to go to college? that had like a troubling background, as you say, like, as you had, like, mm -hmm. like me, I'm ready to go to college and fall, but like, I know, I know it ain't gonna be easy because like, it's a man, I ain't going to like, I'm not going to go to school like, but like, what's the advice you can give me so I can do what I got to do so I can get my degree and make a career out of my Stay with, first of all, um, I don't know who your counselor is here, but stay locked in with your counselor and your students, I mean, and your teachers, letting them know what you really want to do so they can help guide you. Um, the other thing I said is just, first of all, do it. Don't, no matter what your friends say, the people say, you want to go because you believe that that's something that you can do in spite of your start, right? Like, you, it's inside of you. So regardless of what, it, you know that you can do it. So stay locked in with your counselor. Stay locked in with people that's going to help you get there. Stay locked in with people that can help you with a roadmap, a realistic roadmap that will be good for you. Don't try to go in, if, if you know you're struggling academically, you're like, well, I want to be a doctor, hold tight. It ain't that you can't, but how do we start to get to that? Don't just go kick in the door, because here's the thing. You can go try to do too much too early, and then it hits you back so hard that you lose your level of belief. So you want to incrementally do things so that your level of belief can grow as you do things. So make sure that whatever you do next, it's not easy, but it's something you know would work you can accomplish. Don't do nothing that's going to run you into a brick wall and then you lose belief and now all of a sudden you just give up. So work with people that can help you create that roadmap to get you to where you know you want to go. And then once you see that thing, a goal is not, I know we use the word goal for me, a goal is not the thing that's way out there. A goal for me is what's next. That's a goal for me. So I think when we put our goals way out there, it makes it more difficult to get to them. So we often don't even try to go because of everything we think we got to go through to get it. But if I could just say the only goal I got is what's next. When I woke up this morning, my first goal was to come rock out with y'all. And then my next goal is I got a meeting up after this. So don't let goals be things that are way out there. Just let it be what's next. It'll help you build your level of belief a lot better, a lot faster, and a lot more effectively. But find people that's going to help you create that roadmap. All right? Yes. I think inside you know what you can do. You when you know how you like feel like when you think about something, you're like, man, I know I can do that. It just does something inside of you that you nothing else really gives you. That's when you know it's something that's really inside of you. And don't let nobody tell you you can't be something. Uh, when I first told my grandmama I wanted to be a comedian. You would have thought that my grandmother was like, no, you better go get a real job, boy, which my aunt said. Um, but my grandmother told me two things. She said, baby, if you want to be a comedian, go be a comedian. Second thing she told me, but you got to make a plan. Don't think you're just going to walk on that stage and be funny and things just going to happen. You got to make a plan. So like I was telling my brother back here, make that plan and that roadmap to where you're trying to go. But you got to have a plan. And a plan might not be this long, drawn out thing. It can be just three things that you need to do next, but make a plan. So I want to say I appreciate every one of y'all listening. I appreciate what y'all are going to do in life. You all are starting where you are because you're special, not because something's wrong. A lot of kids, a lot of people ain't strong enough to be in your shoes. The strength that all of you have is a unique thing. It's not making sense to you right now, but as you grow in life, you're going to see that the reason you are in this position right now is that because the strength that you're gaining, you're going to need it later to do good for other people. Don't feel bad about your circumstances. Forgive people that may have hurt you because that forgiveness releases that power or that, should I say, that I wait on you. Y'all are strong. A lot of people can't be you. A 
lot of people can't go through what you're going through or have gone through because they weep. This is not the thing that hard we rock it with. You are some of the strongest people we have around. Feel pride in that. While you still may not want to go through the stuff that you're going through, be proud of your strength. Use that strength later on for yourself, and like I keep saying, and for others. God bless y'all. I'm Michael David Thank you.